very happy to, to join this session. Um, as it was mentioned by uh, Francisco, my name is Ariana Torres and I'm leading the quantum computing efforts at CERN. And today I will be touching upon the following topics, so quantum computers, what, when, how. And although I won't pretend I can give you all the answers in the next 20 minutes, half an hour, and probably uh, neither of the three of the speakers today can, I think it's, uh, yeah, I will try my best to shed some light in, in this topic that is sometimes a bit obscure, I would say, right? Uh, that, you know, we hear quantum and half of us try to run out of the room. Um, <clears throat> so before um, saying anything about quantum computing, I want to first explain uh, why I'm leading this efforts at CERF. And for that, let me just say two brief words about what SURF is. So as mentioned before, uh, SURF is um, the collaborative organization for IT, or I see a typo, in the Dutch education and research. So we do all sorts of different activities. We do data storage and management. We also operate the network infrastructure among all the different universities in the Netherlands and between the Netherlands and, for example, CERN. We provide all sorts of educational tools. Um, but maybe the, the interesting one here today is that we also own and operate the National High Performance Computing Center, so our supercomputer called Snellius. And um, in general, I mean, as, as most uh, high performance computing centers, you know, we are interested in providing the best possible IT solutions uh, for researchers and students to, to do science. And in general, you know, the question, why should we care about quantum computing? Well, it all comes down to, or it boils down to our users. And here on the right-hand side, I'm showing a chart of more or less how our domain of users is distributed. So we have a lot of users of uh, chemistry and material science. I think this is actually very uh, general for most HPC. There is always a lot of chemistry and material science users. And we also have a lot of fields, uh, such as, uh, for example, astronomy, computer science, life sciences, physics, that are more and more in the last years using uh, tools like machine learning or well, methods like machine learning. So if we want to uh, continue providing these users with the right tools, we need to understand, update, and grow with our users. So we really need to see where these, these fields moving towards and you know, what do they need in the future uh, from an HPC center. And of course, uh, there are many, many directions that all these fields could evolve. Um, what is true though, is that conventional technologies are, are to some extent running out of steam. And by conventional, I really mean like, you know, the old fashioned things. So we're really entering in this era of much more heterogeneity in, in how computing is done. Um, the era of federated computing, of specialized computing, of exascale computing. And among these non-conventional technologies, uh, quantum computing is definitely an option and more so for HPC users because um, two of the, the main sort of uh, applications expected from quantum computing are uh, quantum chemistry or, or chemistry and material science and machine learning. So if you remember the, the, the chart of before, well, it seems very relevant that we pay attention uh, to what quantum computing is, right? Or, or how should we bring this to our users and how should we uh, enable this uh, to our users in the future. So this is a bit to try to give you the rationale why SURF is doing that. And I'm actually the lucky person that is doing the quantum computing at SURF, but we also have initiatives in, in other technologies. So of course, when we say quantum computing, then a lot of questions start arising in, in, in our heads, right? Uh, first of all is what, is our, what are quantum computers? What do they need them for? Is this even important for me? Should I care? When should I care? How can I access them? How do I program them? You know, there's a lot of questions. I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience has uh, questions for it. And I'm hoping uh, that today with these three talks, we can at least, you know, give some insight into some of these questions. So uh, my task for today, I think there would be a bit of a buildup of, of talks. It's really focused on giving the basics of quantum computing. Uh, to really give you a feeling of what a quantum computer is. And uh, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, I will start that uh, by just first uh, going into the classical side, right? So um, uh, to really, what is a bit? So really a classical bit. Uh, and a, a classical bit is just the basic unit of a classical computer is how we store, but also how we process information in a quantum computer, right? So we represent information as a string of bits. Uh, a bit is nothing else. It actually stands for a binary digit. So it's just a, 
a, a bit can only have two values, a zero or a one, just like here in the pictures, right? You can have a zero or a one. And basically, um, each bit represents a logical state, so zero or one. And normal computers just work by processing information stored in bits. So then what is a quantum bit or a qubit, uh, how it's mostly known? Well, a quantum bit is just the, the basic unit of quantum computers. It's uh, in an analog way how we store and process information in quantum computers. But as opposed to the bits, which are really just have two logical states, zero or one, a qubit actually has uh, some unique properties. And among them is the property called superposition, which allows a qubit to be in any state in between zero and one. So that means that a qubit can actually have infinite values, right? Because if you think that it can be uh, any, any combination of zero and one, so it's a superposition of states. It means it's a combination of these two states, right? And depending how much of zero or how much of one you, you have, you might be closer to here or closer to here, but it's really an infinite, a continuum of states. So just to say a bit more of words about a qubit, a qubit, Fundamentally, it's just a two-state quantum mechanical system. So any mechanical system, quantum mechanical system that has the property of superposition together with inter interference and entanglement can be a qubit. Now, I already said a bit of superposition, which is this ability to be in two states sort of at the same time. <laughs> um, so let me just say two words about interference and entanglement, but I won't dive into them. Um, so interference uh, refers to really what probably you're thinking classically, right? Like this ability of either reinforce or destroy the state of a, of a system. And entanglement refers to the uh, ability of different qubits to act as a group. So they really become entangled, as the word says. And then, you know, an action in one of the qubits has, uh, uh, um, is an action that affects several qubits at the same time. So that's a very sort of, simplistic uh, uh, way of putting it. So that's what a qubit is. In a bit more of a formal uh, way, and I promise this is my only sort of Einstein slide as it's uh, normally referred to, a uh, qubit can be represented by what we call a state vector. So it's this, this item here, which is a psi. This is the classical notation to say this is a quantum state. So you have this, what is called a bracket. And uh, basically, this idea of superposition is represented by the fact that you can uh, say that psi is the sum of one of the states, zero, plus the other state. And how much of one state or the other is basically uh, determined by these two coefficients, alpha and beta. So basically, you know, if, it's, if psi is in state zero, then alpha would be one, beta would be zero. If psi is in state uh, one, then alpha would be zero, beta would be one. Anything in between is just depends on the values of alpha and beta. Um, because obviously the state has to be in uh, a state, I mean, in zero or one when in the future, well, there are certain properties that alpha and beta have. So alpha and beta are normally refer to the probability amplitudes. They can be complex numbers. And then the sum square, uh, the, the, yeah, their absolute value square has to be equal to one. Um, the, the most interesting part here, or the one that I want to highlight, is that the state vector can be, the full state can be described by these two values, right? So if we know the value of alpha and the value of beta, then we basically have the information of what the state of the qubit is. Um, maybe just as an idea to give a bit of a, a physical representation, uh, a qubit can be represented as an arrow. So um, if you think again of state zero, we can think of you know the this state zero being an arrow pointing upwards, so to the state zero, and an arrow pointing downwards representing state one, and then any state in between can be represented as a sum of a contribution of zero and a contribution of one. So for example, here we have a bit of a more contribution of zero than a contribution to one. They are always closer to zero. Here we have a state which is sort of equally uh, um, it has an equal contribution of zero and one. Maybe just to say uh, one word, because you would have maybe expected here to see 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, but that's not true because normally the probability or the, the, the probability of measuring one or zero, and I'll come back to that in a second, is uh, the square of this value. 
So that's what you need to keep in mind. And I'm sorry, I don't know if the questions are supposed to be at the end. I cannot see the chat now, but I guess the questions are at the end. Now, what is interesting about qubits is that we can, just as we can manipulate bits, we can also manipulate qubits. So we can really, you know, if we start with a qubit in a specific value, so let's say we, we start with a qubit that has a value of zero, we can apply operations to change them into a different value. So in this case, I'm applying an operation, which is a rotation in the y-axis. So imagine a y-axis coming out of, of the screen. Uh, so I'm doing a 180 rotation and then putting the state, the, the initial qubit that was in state zero into state one. And I can do all sorts of different operations, right? I mean, this was a 180 degrees rotation, but you could actually rotate any angle that you want. You can also have special rotations. For example, here I'm representing what is called the, the Hadamard gate. The Hadamard gate is very interesting because it puts the initial qubit that was in state zero into a superposition state. So now here we have a superposition state that is really an equal sort of contribution of zero and one or an equal probability of getting zero and one when you measure. So what exactly does it mean to do these manipulations? I'm just going to say it from a, a, a mathematical point of view. What we're doing is um, we are taking our initial state vector. So here, this would be alpha and this would be beta. So I'm in state zero. And then I'm applying a matrix that represents the gate to that vector to get the next vector. So we are moving from a state that is uh, uh, represented by alpha equals to one, beta equals to zero, to a state that is represented by alpha equals to zero, beta equals to one. So that's basically what we're doing. Uh, the way this is represented in a, in a circuit way it would be we start with state zero, we apply a gate X, and then we measure. And mathematically, what we're doing is basically we start with uh, we start with state zero, we apply a gate, which means applying this matrix, and then we get a different state. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times about measurements, and let me just come back to this because with qubits, qubits are probabilistic, right? So it's normally uh, uh, they can be in a superposition, but the moment you measure them they will take one of the two values, zero or one. And which value they take depends on these contributions, these coefficients alpha and beta. So in general, what we're doing when we apply gates is that we're changing these probabilities, right? So here, uh, alpha was equals to one. So that means that if we were to measure at this point, we would get zero. Then we apply an X gate, which changed the state of the qubit. So if now we were to measure at this point, we would get state one. However, if we were, such as in the slide before, for example, here, if we were in this state and I was to measure at this point, then actually I would have 50-50 probabilities of measuring zero or one. So what we're doing when we apply gates is really just sort of playing with what is the, the outcome, right? I mean, sort of manipulating our initial qubit into uh, what we want to get. And there are all sorts of different type of gates. Uh, here I'm just showing uh, the most well-known ones. So you can see some sort of, uh, uh, th that they are, are represented by different matrices. Uh, here is this Hadamard gate I mentioned, which makes a superposition state, uh, an equal superposition state. Uh, these are special type of rotations. Again, here are certain rotations in different axes. And what you see below are actually um, quantum gates uh, when quantum gates that act on multiple qubits, because what I show you so far in the examples are basically just gates acting on one qubit, right? So here is just how do I manipulate one qubit into doing something else? So how do I go from this place to this place? So this gate is really just acting in one qubit. But the reality is that there can be multiple qubits. Let me first start with the fact that um, obviously applying one gate is not interesting. Uh, the, the interesting part arises of combining several gates and to see how we, we are sort of, what are we doing with, with the, the information? How is this sort of manipulating the initial information? So here I'm just putting a very brief example. Again, you start with a qubit at state zero. So then the probability of measuring zero is basically 100%. Probability of measuring one is zero uh, percent. Then you apply some sort of operation, let's say a rotation uh, of 180 degrees uh, in, an, in an axis coming out of your screen. 
And basically that rotated the qubit into state one. So now we're in a different state that if I was to measure here, um, you know, I would get uh, a probability of 100% of measuring state one or close to 100, let's just say it like that. And again, I can apply yet another operation. So for example, uh, rotation on the x-axis, uh, let's assume the x-axis is in this direction of uh, um, 90 degrees, no, less. <laughs> and so you can create, for example, a state that is now equal superposition of both states, right? So now I have 50-50 probability of being on zero or one. So as you can see, you can really like keep applying gates. And what it's basically doing is just changing these probabilities of measuring one state or the other. And so, as I mentioned before, we can not only uh, have like a sequence of gates, but we can actually have several, several qubits in a system. So here I am showing just a, a, a very simple circuit in which you have uh, four qubits. Uh, each one of them is represented by one of these sort of they are called wires, and to each qubit, I'm applying one of, one of these Hadamard gates. So as I mentioned before, this Hadamard gate, what it does is it creates an equal superposition. So what it means is that after this Hadamard gate, this qubit can be in either state zero or one, or it has equal probability that when we measure it, it's on state zero, or it gives us state zero or gives us state one. Now, if you think that each one of these qubits can do the same, then actually this very simple circuit it's a it's it's a random number generator because you get exactly the same probability for any combination of these right so we could have zero one 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 zero 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 and they all have equal probability so i mean this is an example of a of a system where you have uh, several qubits and maybe just to say a bit more about uh, this idea. So um, this is again, the same example as the slide before. So imagine you have two qubits, so this is one qubit, two qubits. Uh, in both cases, you have the superposition of states. So this is after applying uh, this gate here. So after applying Hadamard, we know that we are in this sort of horizontal line, which means we are half the way between zero and one. So this state has 50% uh, probability of being measured at zero. 50% of being measured at state one, same with the other one. So if you think then of the probability of getting all these different combinations, then at the end is 25% for each one of them, right? So it's really a random number generator that you can create by just adding Hadamard gates like that. And this here is just for completeness, the full representation of the states of, of Tsai saying, you know, we are in a superposition of all these different states. Just uh, to give another example, so imagine we are not in an equal superposition, but maybe we have one qubit that is pointing here, the other qubit is pointing there. So then you can again see that there are different probabilities of measuring zero or measuring one. For qubits uh, one, let's call this one qubit one, uh, there is a higher chance of uh, measuring zero. For qubit two, there is a higher chance of measuring one. Um, and so you can really combine all this, uh, uh, I think maybe there is something wrong here, so sorry about that. But my main point is that there's different probabilities of uh, measuring the combined states, right? To really measure that qubit one is zero and qubit two is zero is different than uh, in the previous example where all the probabilities were the same. All right, let me just move to the next one. So what is a quantum circuit? Because you might have heard this uh, concept of quantum circuit. A quantum circuit is nothing but a set of gates acting in a system of qubits, right? It's just really these gates applied to all the qubits which are manipulating um, the, the qubits themselves. So normally a circuit uh, can, uh, I mean, just to say some properties, we normally refer to the circuit width as the number of qubits it has. Each qubit or the operations in each qubit are represented as, as a wire. So you have a wire where you put these gates and those are the operations on that specific qubit. And uh, a circuit is also characterized by the depth, which has to do with how many operations do you have from the beginning till the last measurement. And normally in a circuit, you also have a single qubit gate. So gates that really just operate in, in the state of a qubit, but you also have gates that operate in two qubits at the same time. For example, here, these red ones. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but um, you normally see a combination of these two in quantum circuits. And you actually 
need all these multiple qubit gates to take proper quantum advantage of, of the, the qubits. Um, maybe just to say some other words by convention, normally you always start your quantum circuit um, with all the qubits at state zero, so that's always the starting point. And um, maybe one last thing to say is that then if you want to understand what a quantum algorithm is, where a quantum algorithm is nothing else but a quantum circuit to solve specific problems. So it's really designing you know, quantum algorithms that take advantage of these um, properties that we mentioned at the beginning, so interference, superposition, and entanglement, to really uh, um, solve a problem in a well, hopefully faster way than classical methods. And I'm sure Kuhn will mention a couple of quantum algorithms and applications in his presentation. So back to what is a quantum computer, then, you know, a quantum computer is nothing else but a device that can execute quantum circuits. It's a device that relies on quantum mechanics to perform calculations and by manipulating the quantum bits in order to represent the information. So basically, a quantum computer is a device that, you know, can have it's made out of these qubits, so these um, two-state uh, quantum mechanical systems uh, that can execute the quantum circuits. And, and an important thing here is that if you want to execute these quantum circuits, so let me go back here, that means that these qubits have to be long-lived, right? I mean, we need qubits that live enough to apply certain operations. Now, I am going to just go into this uh, other topic. Is there just one type of quantum computer? And the answer is no. Um, in general, we can have as many different types of quantum computers as we can envision two state mechanical systems, quantum mechanical systems that, uh, that we can operate on, right? And currently, there are many different technologies. Um, just to name a few, um, superconducting loops, that's uh, probably the most well known, is how IBM and Google. Currently, uh, work we have trapped ions. Maybe the most uh, known uh, company doing that is uh, IonQ. We have silicon quantum dots, topological qubits, diamond vacancies, and I'm pretty sure there are some of them missing here. Uh, what's interesting about all these different technologies, or why we haven't settled on any of these technologies, is because they all have different pros uh, and cons, right? Advantages and disadvantages. And it boils down in, into, I mean, Obviously, the manufacturing and, and the, the whole setting, because, for example, superconducting um, computers, they require really cryogenic conditions, so they really require really cold conditions, the same as the quantum dots, but maybe trapped ions, no. But beyond these uh, facility um, issues, they also have different advantages and disadvantages in the sense of the way you implement this gate, the way you uh, physically implement this operation, this this operation of doing, for example, rotations changes in the different technologies. And because they change, also different technologies have different uh, gates available, and the different gates have different properties. They might be faster, they might be slower. And so it's this is a first difference. A second difference has to do more with sort of some sort of geometrical constraints. So um, the qubits in, in these quantum computers, they can, in most cases, not interact all in all. So it's really there is a topology constraint because when you apply these two qubit gates the rule is that the two qubits need to be next to each other and so that means that in order to execute a quantum circuit we need to map that quantum circuit into a specific topology so obviously you know different topologies are good for different settings and the third um, sort of main issue is always the time so these different technologies have different uh, deco uh, the coherence time. So that means that certain qubits can live longer than other qubits. And so that allows you to execute either deeper or less deep circuits. Um, yeah, so that's just to say, you know, this is all the things that go into the different technologies. So how does it actually work when we uh, program something? Because, uh, you know, most of the time we, we, we don't necessarily know all these different technologies. Normally, the way it works when we want to program a quantum computer is that uh, we program a circuit in a high-level programming, high programming language, such as Python. Um, so we basically really say, you know, this is how my circuit looks like. Uh, I start all my qubits at state zero. I want to apply all these gates 
uh, in the first step, uh, the second step, then I apply these two qubit gates, et cetera, et cetera. So we really create this input circuit. And what actually happens behind this, the, the scenes, to call it somehow, is that this input circuit is optimized to actually fit the right topology. So this is normally done in different uh, steps, and this is just the, the workflow specifically of IBM, where they first take all the three qubit uh, gates and then they decompose them. Then they um, place, because here you call them zero, one, two, three, four, but obviously, you know, this needs to have a meaning in the, act, in the actual quantum computer. So then they, they do the placement, then uh, what is called here routing is really matching the circuit such that it matches with the topology of your specific circuit. So that all the gates that need to be executed between, for example, qubit four and qubit zero can be executed. Then uh, the whole circuit is uh, translated into the basis gate. So the gates that are actually available in that uh, specific backend. And at the end, everything is anyway optimized. So uh, basically, if you ever want to program a quantum computer, what you need to do is really just write this. And normally, all these parts are happening either at the SDK provider or at the hardware backend provider. Obviously, also some people really likes to program all the way till here and even further to what is called the pulse level. But for just a general uh, user, we normally program at this level and then we let all these optimization steps be done behind the scene. Now, just to say uh, a little bit about what's uh, more or less um, available today, and uh, this is a slide I, I took from uh, the Quantum Daily, and I added the things in black because I think it was a bit outdated. But this gives you a bit of an idea of the different companies, uh, yeah, the, the coherence time of the qubits, the gate fidelity, so how good are the gates, the gate operation time, because of course it's not only about how long, you know, if you want to do a circuit with many operations. It's not about only how long does the qubit can live, but also how fast the gates are, right? So it's a combination of these two. Uh, the connectivity, as I mentioned, ideally you would want to have all to all, but this is not the case in most uh, technologies. So then you always need to do a bit of routing. Um, yeah, and then you can see here the pros and cons according to the quantum daily. And then maybe just let me mention a couple of uh, companies. I mean, here, as I said, uh, the, the most known examples of superconducting qubits is IBM and Google, but also uh, IQM, Orange Quantum, uh, um, Oxford Quantum Syst uh, Circuits, Fujitsu. In the ion trap uh, here in, in Europa, we have uh, Europe, we have, for example, Alpine Quantum Technologies. Um, photonic computing, uh, I didn't mention anything about that, but also here in Europe we have, for example, Quix in the Netherlands and Condela in France, uh, neutral atoms, um, we have Pascal in France, atom, uh, atom computing and Quera. So you can see that there is really all over the place. Uh, NV Diamonds is Quantum Brilliance, which is, uh, now I'm maybe saying it wrong, but I think it's also Austria, etc. Uh, so there is a lot going on uh, with the different technologies. Uh, we haven't settled into what is the best option. Um, so yeah, it's still very exciting. And also I want to say that it's uh, within Europe, we have uh, yeah, probably examples of all these technologies being developed in all the different countries. So maybe just to finish my presentation, and I'm hoping uh, I'm on time because I haven't really kept track of it. I want to say just something very briefly about um, yeah, access to quantum computers and, and some initiatives that serve in Europe. So, um, of course, now I presented, you know, what is a quantum computer? Uh, how would you program them? Uh, but the second question is, okay, and then how do I submit my circuit to the quantum computers? And um, there are different ways. There are many providers uh, that have cloud access. Most of the quantum computing right now is uh, uh, based on cloud access. There are providers like um, AWS and Azure where you can also just, you know, be a, uh, that cloud provider, get access to several backends because they have made agreements with them. Um, but there are also other initiatives, for example, at Surf, and uh, this, I think it's also the case for other countries. We have uh, sort of test beds of how to connect quantum computers to, to our HPC center that we're exploring. So how could users really submit their jobs via an HPC center? 
And we have also, for example, an initiative which we call Access to Quantum Technologies, where we have also created our own uh, SURF research cloud portal to get access to certain backends. Uh, and uh, maybe just a word about Europe, but I'm sure Mika will say much more about this. There is also a big initiative in Europe um, to connect HPCs to quantum computers to provide access to the users uh, to quantum computers. So it was uh, last year, um, six sites uh, across the European Union were, um, yeah, were selected to host uh, a quantum computer. So uh, the, the Czech Republic, France, Germany, Italy, Poland, and Spain. So, you know, beyond having access via the cloud, uh, uh, in the future, there will be also access via HPC centers. But Mikael will for sure say much more about this in his talk.